Good morning. Welcome to Cedar Creek Bible Church. I see lots of visitors this morning. Glad that you all could join us. We certainly pray that the service will be a blessing to you this morning. To begin with, we'll start with our scripture reading, which will be found on the back side of your bulletins. I'll ask you to stand with me as we read this responsibly. I will read the black print, and you all can respond with the red print. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. At this time, I'll ask you to remain standing for our first hymn, hymn number 478, Soldiers of Christ Arise. 478 in your hymn books. Amen. Excellent singing. At this time, I'll ask you to pull out the insert in your bulletin, and we'll go ahead and sing, O Church, Arise.
Thank you. You may be seated. Wyatt already welcomed you as visitors. We're going to receive an offering soon, and I encourage you to just relax. Take your gifts back to your home church where they depend on them as well. Seth and Darla Curtis, who were with us at our most recent Mission Sunday, plan to return soon to the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I'll be praying for them this morning as well. Let me join you in prayer. Father, we know about you. We know about you only because you've revealed truth about yourself in the Bible. Lord, we trust this revelation because the Old and New Testaments are inspired by your Spirit. As the Apostle Peter made it clear, men who penned the Scriptures spoke from you as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We've come to believe. We've come to believe that the Bible, all of its words and all of its parts, is your word. We have an amazing ability, though, Lord, to live day by day as if you haven't spoken. As James reminds us, we look into your word and we walk away without making any changes as if we've never seen it. Forgive, Lord, our laziness. Forgive our insolence. Forgive our lack of commitment to obey you. You haven't held us at arm's length because of our sin, Father. For that, we are eternally grateful. You've blessed us with the privilege of serving you often in unseen and unnoticed ways. I ask, Lord, that the report this morning that our friends who represented us and you and who served at Camp Kobiak uh, the, earlier this spring, I ask that that might be encouraging to this congregation. Lord, bless Seth and Darla as they get ready to return to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Lord, use Pastor as he leads us into Matthew 24 again this morning. Use your word to change us as we now give our gifts to you gifts that grow out of our love for you. We do so with confidence that you'll use them, not just for the good of people around us, but for your own glory, both here and far. We ask all these things expectantly in the name of our Savior. Amen.
Okay. Why don't we ask the group that wants to camp Kobiak, I'll have you. You don't have to get out of your seat. Just stand up where you're at. And uh, so you can see who they are. We're missing two that I'm aware of, and that's Tammy and Brian. And uh, they couldn't be with us today. But this is the group that you see in the picture. And we're going to walk. You can sit down now. I might have you stand up again. You know me. You never know. Uh, we're going to walk through some pictures so that you can kind of see what we did. Uh, before, as, as we get started, some of the projects that the camp gave to us were things like cleaning the cabin. Uh, we taped, painted, and installed some electrical outlets and switches in a room over the gymnasium. Helped in the kitchen, preparing meals clean it up after ourselves, and for part of that, that was to take care of ourselves. And the staff would join us for a meal. Uh, wood cutting, we cut a lot of wood. There was more wood we could have cut. We could have cut wood until the cows come home. <laughs> but we just, we ran out of time and the heat was killing our saws. So we had to finally call, quit at the end of the third day. Work on a dump truck and a people mover bus, yard work and clean up around the camp, and rekey cabin box. So we're going to start through some of the pictures, and I'll probably make some comments as we go, but this is a group. This picture was taken in the main mess hall, the dining room. This was a couple modes of transportation. We were about a about a half a mile away from the main camp. They had our own area way back in the woods. And I'm not sure if they just wanted to get us alone or if they didn't trust us. So it says, just put these guys back where they're not going to bother nobody. So we were quite a ways uh, back in there. So sometimes those vehicles come in handy to run us back and forth. These are the cabins that we stayed in, really nice. They, uh, it was a circle of cabins. In the middle, you'll see a circle, a campfire. This was uh, one of the pictures around the campfire. They had a really nice area. We would uh, have devotions there in the campfire at the end of the day. This was the dining hall. This would be a picture of when the college kids came. It, we went up Wednesday, got there, ate lunch, and went right to work. Uh, Friday afternoon, college-aged young adults that used to be campers came back for a short retreat Friday and Saturday. They weren't staffed enough to accommodate them completely. So in preparation, we had said, we'll help them. So by Friday, our project, we had brought them to an end, and then we converted the staff. We helped them prepare, serve meals, and clean up, and help them with uh, taking care of that little retreat that they had. This is a woodshed. We're kind of going backwards, but woodshed and some of the people that helped with cutting wood. That shed was empty when we got there. You'll see the empty later. And it had a problem, too, but you'll see that. Uh, Jim worked on the diesel stuff. Every once in a while, I'd go back in the woods and find him, because he was working all alone back there, all by himself on the diesel. On a, on a, this was the bus, and I think we got a picture of him on the... But we'd check in on him every once in a while or take him some water to drink. But this is the lake. Uh, that they use for the kids, and, uh, and those who've gone to camp are probably going to be familiar with these pictures. Uh, we could probably have done some work there, but they weren't really ready to uh, set up for us to do that, but we stayed plenty busy. <clears throat> Our daily routine, routine, we get up in the morning, go down to the dining hall, have breakfast, and then we went to work. We worked until the 
we were called for lunch about noon. And we went and ate again. You'll think all we did was eat. But then we go back to work and work all afternoon until supper or dinner time. And, and once we were finished there, we didn't go back to work. They would say, you had, you've done enough. Go back and relax and enjoy your campfire. And we'd meander around the camp and, and uh, take in a few things. Here we are back at the cabin in the camp area. Uh, back there, every night we had devotions and like s'mores and a snack. And, and uh, Carissa did one night for us of devotions. Kathy did a night and Mike did a night for devotions. While we was gathered around there the first night, I asked them, I said, how does this fit as being a short-term mission trip? Uh, what we went up there to do was to aid the camp in preparation as they were getting ready to run the camp for the young people so that they could give them the gospel and so that they could spiritually challenge hundreds of young people to commit their lives to the Lord's service. So we were kind of a behind the scenes to help them get up and running so they could do a good job of doing that. As we gathered around the campfire that first night up there, we talked about that, how that uh, this was a service of ministry and it was really neat to see the people that went up there, the gifts and their talents, how the camp just like, they were so happy. And that we could share our gifts and talents to help them. Eating again. This was up at the, it was actually, we didn't go out in the woods and cut wood. They actually had a, like a wood yard. That was kind of cool. I'm used to cutting wood somewhere around the brush, but this was like walk down and I Zeke was our boss, and I'd tell him, hey, we need some more wood. And I don't, we may have, there's a pile of wood here. He'd run down through there and flip all these rock logs over. We cut them up and and the gals would carry them over to the splitter, bust them up, and put them in the wood shed. Here's some carrying. Here's our main supervisor with a hat on. And then after, before and after the meals, uh, the only person they had in the kitchen was the regular uh, guy that headed up the menu. It was the, the cook, the head chef. So he needed our help for us to prepare this meal. And he was really grateful of all that. And if you don't think you can serve the Lord, you're too old. Uh, right here, this blows all those excuses away. Because this lady, our mean age of the group that went to camp was probably about 70. And you'll go, what? Yeah, we had a few young people, a lot of old people. And then Donna's one that really brought that mean age up. She's 175 years old. You know, so... It's just, she, I tell her, I say that to her all the time. She's been around here forever. <laughs> oh, serving the Lord. Again, we're eating. We're eating again. Campfire, roasting some marshmallows. Listen, the campfire was a really neat time. We got to know each other. But I warned everybody. I said, what happened at the campfire? Up here stays here. I have some stories I can share with you, but I can't. <laughs> they were pretty good. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Uh, as it got dark, we'd sit around the campfire, and you could hear the whooper will start in, then you could hear the coyotes. And one night, the whooper wills were really going, and all of a sudden, the coyotes really took off, and all of a sudden, they got their victory yell. They must have had a Thanksgiving dinner because they must have caught up with a whooper well, because they were all going, yip, 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 yip. So it was kind of watching the stars above us. Here we are eating again. 
for us to do on devotion the first night. Eating again. We really worked more than we ate. I think we just got more pictures of eating. There's Tammy in the kitchen working, serving. Our supervisor. <laughs> and uh, Mike rekeyed a lot of the locks because at, when the new, uh, I think the manager of the camp kind of took over, all their locks were in a, just a big box. And it was a mess. They had a key for every lock, for every door in the cabin. And there was probably a hundred different ones. And they, they couldn't even lock the doors because they didn't even know what key was in. So Mike spent his whole time, and there's more work to do, uh, straightening that mess out and rekeying these locks so one key would master and would, would take care of all these locks. And they were very, very grateful of that. It's like, you never know if you've got some gift that God can use you. And they were, they were tickled with that. They would take the lock off, bring it to him, he would straighten it out, and then they'd go put that back on. Kathy taking a break there. Leo, uh, Roger and Glenna's grandson with us. Now, Leo come up missing the first day, and Glenn is trying to find him, and I didn't know where he was working. He'd actually hooked up with Brian to help him in the rooms over the gymnasium. And I told Glenn, I said, well, last I saw Leo, he was down laying on the beach at the lake. <laughs> so she took off. I said, he better not be here. He better be working. But there's Brian, hard at work, laying on the floor. There's Jim. He got that thing running, and they were tickled with that. This was the woodshed. You see how crooked that is? It's about ready to fall over. Now, if we was to go back, I told him, I said, we can fix this before we fill it. But what we did is we filled it, so it's too late to fix it. So, uh, but once it was full, it's not going to go nowhere. So, but that's how it was. The first picture you saw it was full. Here it's empty. There's the wood yard. Here's the, the cleaning team. Cleaned all the cabins. Got them ready for all the campers. These are some shots of the, uh, just the camp area, the main area. Uh, it's kind of hilly there. This is the uh, dining hall, the chapel. And then there's a, there's a coffee shop underneath it. We went down there the last day. They gave us some uh, free passage. For, it was about 90 degrees, so we all went and got uh, smoothies. And we're all down there sitting with these college kids, and they're all looking at us because we're all old. <laughs> they're like, where do you guys come from? So finally I says, well, really, we're your age. We just have this disease. It's called old age. So, but then we told them what we were there for. Camp Kobiak. This is our last shot. The staff that was there was really pleased to have us. They had to do all these jobs in their spare minutes. They had to squeeze them in. Our boss, Zeke, told us, I don't know how many times he told us, you guys don't know how much this means to us and how much this is helping us. And all of them did. Every place we were working, all the people that was kind of over us was telling the people the same thing. Because some things had happened, like with some of the guys, uh, an electric generator to run the whole camp, if they lose power when the kids are there, had come in unexpectedly. They'd been trying to get it, and they couldn't because of COVID. And then finally all of a sudden it showed up right then. 
And these guys that normally run around and do all these projects were tied up trying to get this in. They didn't know what they was going to do. So we come along and we bailed them out. But you know what? God knew all about that. It, way as we were, before we were preparing. So when an opportunity to serve him comes up in our lives, your lives, jump at it because it's just, it's really neat to see how God orchestrates this stuff if you're willing to serve. This was a first time for them. It was a first time for us. It went well. We did, as a group and as a church, we sent, we took some money with us to cover ourselves in case we were worthless. <laughs> we figured we would at least pay for our room and board. And the camp was delightfully surprised with that. But uh, I said, hey, let's do this because if we end up being a burden, then at least we, we, we even out the balance sheet. But no, they were really happy. Kobiak means young people. You know what that means? It means to come, believe, and accept. And we have 29 of our kids from the church going this year. So we have a huge investment in this ministry. And I want to thank, and I think the group together, we thank you for sending us and for supporting us in prayer as we represented Cedar Creek Bible Church. And pastors tell me we got a card from the camp, and it was a very well-written card, and they were very appreciative. So I think we represented Cedar Creek Bible Church in a well way by serving him. So we thank you for that. And everybody that we work with, they said, you can come back next year if you want. So we'll see how that works out. I'm kind of looking forward to maybe doing this again. So thank you. Okay, yeah, stand up again. All oh, yours. All right, thank you, Bill. I do have a couple of announcements uh, to make at this time. Uh, one of them is this summer we're going to be having three informal softball practices. This will be occurring on Thursday nights at 6.30, and there's going to be three of them. It's not in your bulletin, so if you want to write these dates down, you can. It's uh, Thursday, June 16th, June 30th, and July 14th. And this is for both men and women. Anybody age 12 and up is welcome to join. So that will be in the bulletin um, in the coming weeks, I trust. And if you're interested in that, please be sure to take note. Also, on Sunday, June 19th, in the afternoon at 4 p.m., there's going to be a hall monitor meeting. That will be here in the sanctuary, and uh, there's just going to be a little bit of training and some updates for that as well. And that will be, again, Sunday, June 19th at 4 o'clock, and I'm sure that will be in the bulletin in the coming weeks as well. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's sing our last hymn this morning. I'll ask you to stand with me as we sing hymn 486. And the junior church may be dismissed at this time as well. In 486, faith is the victory.
Thank you for your singing. You may be seated. I may stray in the fields that are barren, but danger awaits me. I may go, the master will search until he finds me. He'll guide me back. At this time, I'll ask you to take your Bibles once again and turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. We're picking up where we left off last week because I didn't manage to finish the passage that I had in mind to complete. In fact, we pretty much just made it through one verse, although as I told Pastor Norton last week, well, at least I looked at a bunch of other different passages, so... We looked at more than just one verse last week, but we didn't get farther than that in the Gospel of Matthew. So we're in Matthew 24, and the verse that we spent most of our time on was verse 15. And verse 15 brings up the topic of the abomination of desolation. And that is a theme that shows up multiple times in our Bibles. And you may recall where we learn first about the abomination of desolation. Where do we go if we want to learn more about the background of the abomination of desolation? Anybody remember? Book of Daniel, yes. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And there are a couple other passages in Daniel that also refer to that historical event. And there's question about when we're supposed to see the fulfillment of that event. And I encourage, encouraged us that the fact that Jesus is talking about that as a future event in Matthew 24 
shows us that Daniel had in mind something that was still future, even from Jesus' perspective. So when we look at the book of Daniel, we find ourselves talking about a historical figure named Antiochus Epiphanes. And what was he known for? Okay, so he was an invader of Jerusalem, of, of the region of Judah, in that intertestamental period between the books of Malachi and Matthew. And he came in and he did the same kinds of things that the abomination of desolation seems to involve. You'll recall that he did this in 167 BC, that he put an end to circumcision of Jewish boys, that he put an end to sacrifice, and the crowning achievement uh, from his perspective was, was offering a pig to Zeus on the altar in the temple. And so that was indeed a great desecration of the temple, and that was what led to the Maccabean Revolt, and there's a lot of interesting history associated with that time. But I don't think that that counts as the fulfillment, because like I said, Jesus is talking about the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel, and he's telling his disciples they need to be looking forward to that. And then when they see that abomination of desolation, they're supposed to respond in a certain way. So with that as just a little bit of review from last week, I'll direct your attention once again to Matthew 24, 15. And let's go ahead and read the passage that we're looking at for this morning. Matthew 24, 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Do you remember the original three questions the disciples asked that started off this whole extended um, discourse that Jesus is giving in Matthew 24 and 25? Where do we find those three questions? Verse three, verse three is where we see those, right? So in verse three, it says, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, here's three questions, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? That's the second question. And of the end of the age. That's the third question. So as we think back about that, what is the relationship between the sign of Jesus coming and the sign of the end of the age? When do those happen in relation to each other? Have you picked up on that from how, how, how far we've gotten through the Olivet Discourse? I think they happen at the same time. There's no separation between those two questions. You have the end of the age and you have the coming of Christ and those two things are going to happen at the same time they're going to happen together. And we finally come to the return of Christ being mentioned explicitly at the end of our passage that we've looked at this morning. Well, this all seems pretty far removed from us, doesn't it? I'm reminded when I come to a passage like this that so often you and I, when we read our Bibles, I think we're looking for something that is there for us right now, today, in our present lives. And there's so much of the Bible that talks about the future. There's so much in the Bible that is focused on our future blessed hope and also the warning that one day this wicked world is going to be judged and every single person will one day stand before God and give an accounting of their lives. Let me ask you, do you think that that transforms the way that we live right here, right now, today? 
It certainly should, shouldn't it? And so I realize that it's easy when we find ourselves in a complicated passage like every single commentator acknowledged, this, acknowledged that this passage is, it's easy for us to look at that and say, well, it's complicated, I can't really understand it. Let's see if we can go somewhere else in our Bibles that's easier to understand and more relevant for my life today. Now there's no question that Christians who are alive when these events are taking place, they are going to look at this passage and it is going to be exceedingly relevant for them. But I'm here to tell us this morning that God has given us this passage so that we will know ultimately what the destiny of this world is. Does it make a difference for us that this world is not going to go on as it is forever? Does it make a difference to us that this present evil system that is under the thumb of Satan and that is governed by evil human rulers, does it make a difference that one day that system is going to be defeated and overthrown? Absolutely. Does it make a difference that there are going to be false Christs, people coming to present themselves as the fulfillment of God's plan, and yet they are not going to be the real thing? I think it does make a difference. So all of these things, even though it feels like they're far removed from us, they are relevant because they affect the way you and I view the world that we live in right now. Does it look like God is winning in the world around us? Not necessarily, right? We look at the, the current events that surround us. We look at the things going on in our world. We look at the state of our nation, and we sometimes, as Christians, find ourselves despairing, find ourselves worrying about what the future is going to look like. I'm here to tell you, God is going to win. But we have to look to that future fulfillment in order to understand that and have hope in days when perhaps it doesn't look like we are on the winning side. It is our hope in that future fulfillment that gives us courage and that helps us to endure the difficult times that we find ourselves in right now. Well, let's look at these verses in just a little bit more detail in the time that we have remaining. So we talked last week about the abomination of desolation. This is going to be um, a profane act of the Antichrist that is going to happen, and it will signal the halfway point of the tribulation, that final week of seven years that Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter nine. So how much time do we have before Jesus' return once the abomination of desolation starts? Three and a half years. At that point, we, we know what's gonna happen. We know when it's going to happen because we now are in that final week, that final period of three and a half years. And so what should believers who are alive at this time, who see this abomination of desolation taking place, what should they do in response to that in verse 16? Run for the hills. That's not a very encouraging message, is it? That's because things are going to get really, really difficult for the Lord's people who are living on the earth at this time. And I think that there's a special focus in this passage, not only on believers generally, but specifically on believers in the Jewish nation, and also the Jewish nation as a whole, because they are no longer going to be at peace with the Antichrist, but rather he is going to break the covenant that he has made with them, and now they are going to be the enemy. And so that seems to me to be what Jesus is describing here. Those Jews, those believers who are living at this time, when they see the abomination of desolation, they had better get out of Jerusalem because things are about to get very difficult. In fact, Jesus says, don't even take time to prepare yourself for the journey. He says, let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Don't go back for anything. Let not the one who is in the field uh, turn back to take his cloak. And he says that for those who are pregnant, for those who are not in a good position to be able to be traveling, alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. This is going to be an incredibly difficult time, particularly for Jews and for Jewish believers um, at, at the time of the abomination of desolation. So Jesus' command is to get out of town, to flee to the mountains, and I think that that fits well with the symbolism that we see in Revelation chapter 12. Do you remember what Revelation 12 talks about? Revelation 12 talks about this woman who is provided for by God, who is sustained in the wilderness. I think the best way to understand that symbol is to see this woman as representative of the nation of Israel. And so this seems to fit really well with that picture that we encounter in Revelation chapter 12. 
Now, the things that Jesus is saying here sound an awful lot like his advice to those who lived at the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So do you remember what I suggested the relationship between Luke 21 and Matthew 24 is? These are both passages that record parts of Jesus' Olivet Discourse message. So do you remember what I suggested? I think the relationship between Luke 21 and Matthew 24 is? This is just my interpretation. This is just my best attempt to put these passages together. I think that Luke 21 is focused on events that were fulfilled in the first century, that you and I can look back on as historically fulfilled events. Because was Jerusalem literally invaded? Was Jerusalem's temple literally destroyed and scraped off the top of that temple mount? Yes, it was. Were there armies that surrounded Jerusalem? Were there Jews that were killed by the thousands? Yes, there were. And so I think Luke 21 is focused on that historical fulfillment. But when we come to Matthew 24, it's apparent to me that we're now at the end of the age. There is something that is happening even farther out, a longer fulfillment that Christians are going to be looking forward to. So that tells us that as bad as things are in the world right now, hold on to your hat. Things are gonna get worse uh, before they get better, before Jesus returns to right everything that is wrong. So when we look at these verses, we, we have moved past the beginnings of birth pains that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, verses four to 14. That was kind of the general turmoil that we see in our world that is going to happen before the tribulation, and that happens at the beginning of that tribulation period. But now we have come to the place where things are going to get much, much worse. We are now in the period known as the Great Tribulation itself. So what is that going to be like? Well, Jesus gives us a description in verse 21. What does he say this tribulation is gonna be like? It's gonna be great. Will it be like tribulation at other periods of human history? It's gonna be far worse. Boy, that's hard to imagine, isn't it? As you think about the history of the nation of Israel, as you think about the things that ethnic Jews have had to suffer through the millennia of their history, can you imagine something worse that is still to come? That seems to be what Jesus is saying. He says that this is going to be a great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. I don't think that Jesus is exaggerating. I don't think he's using hyperbole. This is going to be really, really terrible. And in fact, Jesus says, if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. So it's a good thing Jesus is revealing ahead of time that this is only three and a half years because if this went on and on and on, then nobody would, in fact, survive. But God cares about his promise, doesn't he? As bad as this is going to get, he is going to deliver his people. There will be a remnant of Jews who survive, and at the end of all of this, they are going to look on the one whom they have pierced, and what are they gonna do? They're going to mourn because they're going to recognize him and they're going to receive him as their Messiah. So as bad as this is going to get, there is hope that is going to come. So this is why those believers or those Jews who are living during this time ought to flee when they see that abomination of desolation. It's because that's the beginning of this period that we know as the Great Tribulation. How long is the Great Tribulation? The Great Tribulation is... Three and a half years. I, I know we, we're used to thinking of the tribulation as a period of seven years, but you'll recall that the abomination of desolation is something that happens at the middle of Daniel's 70th week. So once that abomination of desolation takes place in the holy place, I believe it will be a reconstructed temple. At that point, we know that there are now three and a half years before Jesus will return. And eventually, and at that time, he will conquer his enemies and he will reign. So that is why believers should flee when they see the abomination of desolation. Uh, there are other passages in our Bible that talk about this. I think there are passages in the Old Testament that very clearly fit with what Jesus is describing here. Listen to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 30, verse seven. He says, alas, that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. Does that sound like the tribulation to you? that Jesus is describing, I think it fits very well. Listen to what Daniel 12, one says. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. What will that time of trouble be like? 
such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. What does that sound like? Sounds like exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24, doesn't it? But at that time, your people, the Israelites, shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Also, Zechariah chapter 13 says, in the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish. Can you imagine two-thirds of a, of a society being killed and destroyed? It's unthinkable, and yet that's what's going to happen. And one-third shall be left alive, and I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. And that also sounds to me very much like this tribulation period. But do you notice about those verses that the word tribulation isn't used? This is something that we've got to work really hard at when we interpret these passages. It would be very easy for us to open a concordance or to go online, open, open up a, a Bible app, and just search for tribulation and assume that those passages that come up are the only ones that talk about this time of tribulation. But I think when you look deeper at what's going on, these are passages that have been preparing us for the reality of that tribulation all the way back to the Old Testament. So that shouldn't be a surprise to us. This is something that the Bible has been talking about for a while. And there are different terms that the Bible uses to describe that. Sometimes it talks about that time period as the day of the Lord. It sometimes talks about that period as birth pains. Um, it talks about it as the time of Jacob's trouble. These are all terms that I think refer to that same period of time. Well, two important characteristics about this period of time. First of all, the Great Tribulation is unprecedented. That's a good reason to think that Jesus isn't talking about something that happened in the first century, right? A historical fulfillment from our perspective doesn't work well to understand the fulfillment of this. If the Great Tribulation is unprecedented, if no one else is ever gonna see anything this bad, this has got to be still future, even from our perspective today in the 21st century. That also is why it doesn't work for me to see this as just a symbolic period. There are some people who think that tribulation is just what the church has been experiencing in the world for the last 2,000 years. I think what Jesus is talking about here is much more specific than that. Um, it's not satisfying to me to see that as just describing the history of the last 2,000 years. It's unique, it's without parallel, and it is still future. But not only is the Great Tribulation unprecedented, the Great Tribulation is time limited. It is not going to go on forever. There is going to be a conclusion, and Jesus is going to bring that conclusion about with his own return. Now, what Jesus says about the elect in here brings up the matter of people being saved during the tribulation. Do you think people are going to be saved during the tribulation? You know, there are some dispensationalists who have said through the years that actually people are not going to continue to be saved uh, in the tribulation. In fact, if the rapture occurs and you're left behind, then at that point it's just too late. Um, I don't see any clear evidence of that in Scripture. And in fact, I would feel like the fact that we have 144,000 witnesses, the fact that we have the two witnesses, that would suggest to me that there are going to be many people who will recognize what is going on and they will put their faith and trust in Christ. Now, I realize that Revelation talks about people who refuse to repent in spite of God's judgment. But that's always the case, isn't it? There are some people who see what God is doing, they hear the gospel message, and they react to it positively, and then there are others who are hardened when they see that judgment. And so I think that just like we see now, there are gonna be people who respond in both of those ways. The point is, God is gonna have a remnant. There are going to be believers who are existing on this earth during that time. I trust that you and I won't be one of them. Because, of course, we believe in what the Bible teaches about the rapture. And the rapture, I think, is what God gives to us as our hope that we will be spared from the day of God's wrath, talking specifically about the tribulation. Well, we also learn from this passage that there are going to be many false messiahs. Are Christians supposed to be gullible people? I think sometimes we get that reputation. And sometimes, unfortunately, people give credence to that reputation because somebody somewhere starts making claims about the return of Christ. Maybe they even claim to be the Messiah. And there are Christian people who are not well taught, who don't know what their Bibles teach about the end times, and they find themselves really intrigued by that. 
they find themselves giving credence to those things. Should you and I, because we are Christians, because we believe that Jesus is going to return, should we be gullible and accept any claim that Jesus is returning right now or that, in fact, he has already returned? No, Jesus does not want us to be deceived by religious hucksters like that. He wants us to believe that Jesus is coming, but that when he comes, there's not gonna be any question. We're not gonna have to take anyone else's word for that. It will be very clear, and it won't be a matter for debate. It's gonna be visible. It's gonna be like lightning flashing from east to west. Everyone is going to see it. There's going to be no question about that. So when will Jesus return? Right on time, that's for sure. We know he's going to return three and a half years after the abomination of desolation. When is that? Well, three and a half years after the start of that 70th week. When is that? There's a lot that we don't know, right? Once God sets all of these events in motion, you and I have solid Bible teaching to help us understand what's going to happen. And even those believers who are alive at that time, they're gonna have answers to the questions that are going to be very, very important. They're gonna be life, matters of life and death for them. And they are going to have clear answers to that once this period of time starts. In the meantime, you and I don't know how long this is gonna take. So what should we do in the meantime? Should we lose faith that Jesus is gonna come back? No, because we know that with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. So if Jesus comes back tomorrow to rapture us away, we won't be surprised by that. If he sets all of this stuff in motion a hundred years from now, our faith doesn't need to be shaken because we know that he is going to come back and we understand that he is completely trustworthy. Everything he says comes to pass. If the things that Jesus talks about in the Olivet Discourse were fulfilled in the first century, if as we saw a few weeks ago that every stone of the temple was pushed off the top of that temple mount, not one stone was left on top of another, we believe that what Jesus says about the end times will come to pass. And so we can put our confidence and trust in that. So let's not be deceived about Jesus' return. That's a big application for us when it comes to these verses. But I would also suggest that you and I need to make sure that we are ready for Jesus' return. Jesus' return is not going to be the very next thing that happens when we talk about the second coming, the visible return of Jesus to this earth to judge his enemies. There are some things that are gonna happen before that. That's what this whole period of the Great Tribulation is talking about. But as I suggested, if we believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, the way to not have to go through this time of unprecedented tribulation is to get saved now, to put your trust in Jesus now. That is the way to avoid that period of unprecedented wrath. So do you wanna go through the great tribulation? I sure don't. The application is to make sure that we have put our faith and trust in Jesus as our savior now. And if you do that, your eternity is secure. And if you find yourself experiencing tribulation in the world, as Jesus said, is gonna be the lot of all Christians. If you find yourself experiencing persecution, it's gonna be okay. Because just as the, the great tribulation will be time limited, even your suffering in this life, your experience of persecution is time limited. And eventually it's going to be over and there is great hope that is, that is there for all of us on the other side of that. So we can have confidence and joy and hope looking forward to the future and Jesus' coming reign over all this earth. And as we think about that, uh, to close the service this morning, I'd like us to conclude by singing the song, He Will Hold Me Fast. Wyatt, would you come and lead us in that as our closing song? Let's stand together as we sing, He Will Hold Me Fast.
us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. This was a, a tough passage to wrap our minds around in such a short time, but we just pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit to help us to ponder on this for the rest of the week. What we do know is that you are a sovereign God, that you have planned out future events from eternity past, and that you know what is going to happen. You are in control of the whole situation. Our prayer today, Lord, is that if there is a man or a woman or a boy or a girl here who has not come to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that they would make that decision today, because that is what is going to make all the difference in their lives. It's what's making the difference in all the rest of our lives. We pray today as we travel home that you would give us safety, that you would bring us back again tonight so that we can worship together and learn more from your word together this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.